At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. Elaine Dillard was appointed Dean of the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences at UC Davis in January of 2014. Dr. Dillard joins us to discuss the work of the university, her unique perspective on the importance of food production to our region and the rest of the world, and her own journey as the leader of one of the foremost agricultural research institutions in the world. Dean Dillard, did you know when you first started in your career that agriculture was gonna be so cool at this particular moment? I had no idea that it was gonna be this cool. Um, when I first started out, I really wanted to be a scientist. And I knew that I loved plants and I just had no idea that that would just eventually take me into agriculture. Now, you decided to pick as your specialty, your focus, mm -hmm. investigating diseases related to plants. Mm -hmm. What led you in that direction? So I was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley and I was taking a course, they allowed in the biology major, you were allowed to take a lot of different courses under the biology uh, umbrella and one of them was plant pathology and I had a really outstanding teacher who uh, just really inspired me with this and I just fell in love with diseases of plants. And so you became sort of the equivalent of like a CSI investigator to put kind of a television spin on it in the plant world? Exactly, so my, what I started doing was looking at what the causes of those plant diseases were and trying to investigate how and why it happened and what could be done better so that the plant wouldn't come down with disease. Now, now you were raised in San Francisco yes. and went to UC Berkeley and you ended up out in the field. <laughs> How did that happen? How did that happen? So I kind of blame it on the family in a way. Um, my parents and my aunt would buy me little chemistry sets and microscopes and things for Christmas because they knew that I wanted to be a scientist. And so the way that happened was it really kind of helped fuel that investigative uh, approach. And then I got at UC Berkeley and I fell in love with plant pathology. Um, but everyone was saying, if you're gonna go to graduate school, you should go to UC Davis and do it there. So I came to UC Davis, I did a master's in soil science and then a PhD in plant pathology. And it was the best time of my life. I really loved it. So then you moved all the way across the country, had a couple of other <laughs> adventures and then ended back up here uh, once again. That's correct. So I, uh, when I finished up my PhD at UC Davis, I got a job at Cornell University and I started there as an assistant professor. And the beauty was that I was allowed to work on any plant disease as long as it was a vegetable crop and any disease I wanted. And so I still remember my first problem that walked in the door was a sick tomato plant <laughs> that had a disease called anthracnose. And uh, I worked on that for a long time, and then I walked into a bunch of different crops from there. And and you know, agriculture has kind of been in the family business because your husband had involvement in agriculture at one point. That's right? correct. So I met my husband at UC Berkeley, and uh, it was very interesting. I was so excited because he was a, from a farming family, and. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna marry a farmer. And uh, as it turned out, he didn't continue farming, and, uh, but I got more and more interested in the farming aspects. And so um, it's been wonderful. <laughs> and your son does work with plants as well. My son has the green thumb as well. He decided to start a landscaping business. And so he is uh, his, his own boss. He's got his own business in Ithaca, New York. So can you guys like have a family dinner without? <laughs> Dissecting everything that's on the table? It, it is difficult. My mother says it's hard to look at salad the same way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're all looking at salad <laughs> in different ways. Mm -hmm. T today, farm to fork is, you know, essentially the way that we're branding this region. 
I was recently in New York, and uh, New York State is trying to sort of steal that moniker from us, Absolutely. but they're not the only part of the country that is. <laughs> what, has, what has brought our culture in this country to the point where it is that we've rediscovered agriculture, which is where our society in this country started, mm -hmm. but today it's all the rage. It's all the rage, and I think part of it may have started when we had the big recession and more and more people started trying to grow a little bit of their own vegetables in their yards. And for many communities, you can have chickens in urban environments. So there you would have your eggs, a protein source, and then you could also raise some vegetables. But I, I think also people just got more interested in food and what it could be. It, it doesn't have to just be boiled, but it can be fixed in very exquisite ways that really um, are good for the palate. So I think that's part of it as well. Well, you know, in this region, when I moved here in the early 70s, mm -hmm. even raising the fact that I had grown up part of my, my younger years on a farm was considered to be really uncool. And so, <laughs> For some of us, it's, it's really kind of surreal that everyone wants to talk about farming and fresh food, and that sort of thing. It raises a question, though. Is there a viable lifestyle for someone to go into farming today? Mm -hmm. It is very much a viable lifestyle. And in this region in particular, we have support systems in place to help beginning farmers. Really? So at UC Davis, we have faculty members that actually are working on grants that support beginning farmers. But there's also a place called the Center for Land-Based Learning in the Winters Woodland area. And they take in new beginning farmers, help them learn the ropes. And once they've started building a business, then they're sort of pushed out the nest to go find their own place. But they get help looking for the capital. They get help with finding a banker. And they're, it's, it's like a farming incubator. It's like a farming incubator, it really is. And I think it's a wonderful thing. And it also helps you, especially if you're someone like me, who didn't come from a farming family, so you weren't gonna inherit land and you can't afford to buy it. So this way you can start off small in this incubator and then buy a small amount of land, farm that and eventually grow. So it's a really special place. The Sacramento region is very supportive of small farms. And, and do you have any examples you can share with us of models where it is that someone who wants to farm can do so on a small scale but actually make a viable living at it? Yes. Um, so in this Center for Land-Based Learning in this small farm environment, I met a young man that was growing vegetables uh, for chefs in San Francisco Bay Area. Really. And so he's producing them organically. He's make, it's a small scale operation and the chefs can dictate exactly what size of zucchini they want, if they want squash blossoms or if they want fresh lettuce. Um, and so he delivers just about every day to the Bay Area to those chefs and they pay a premium price for that. And so yes, he's making a living. He's doing very, very well. Wow. That, that actually makes me wonder about one of the debates that's going on today. You know, in our grocery stores we see our regular produce and then we see organic produce. And as a consumer, it's hard to know what's, what's one, what's going to cost. Is the additional cost worth it? But really, is the flavor all that different? Okay. You're, you have to be a connoisseur of these things. <laughs> Help advise us who are, who are walking into our local supermarket. So my, my primary advice is to eat as many fruits and vegetables as you can. Our nutritionists have looked at this and there's really been a lot of studies that show that if we just increase our intake of fruits and vegetables, whether they're organic or conventionally grown, we will be healthier at the end of the day. And some people prefer the organic, they don't wanna have the pesticides. Others, when you look at how farming is done now, it's done so carefully and it's regulated so heavily that I don't worry about the pesticides because I know that the farmers are doing an excellent job and they're doing it really well. And if they had, they usually don't use anything. In fact, they don't use anything unless there's some major insect or problem that shows up that they absolutely have to control. Well, uh, I'll tell you as a consumer, 
and I don't know whether this is me tricking myself like a placebo effect, but <laughs> I always feel like that the organic tastes better for some reason. <laughs> But I don't know if that's true. If someone put two tomatoes in front of me, whether or not whether would, you could tell I the could difference. really tell the difference. The, the, the thing that I have found is there are certain varieties that organic farmers grow um, because they're not trying to ship it across the United States. And they can hold it longer and let it ripen in place in the field. And those do tend to be sweeter. Carrots are one where I try to buy my local Cape Hay Valley carrots because they're absolutely spectacular compared to anything in the, for, in, in the store, whether it's organic or not. Um, but they're using a variety that you really couldn't ship around, but it tastes absolutely wonderful. So sometimes you're right. And I think when you grow it at home, you leave it on the vine longer. You're not worried about putting it in a container and shipping it to some other state. And so it is, it's always tastes really wonderful when it's fresh. Uh, the other day I had my first taste of asparagus just picked right there in the field and handed to me, uncooked, to eat. It was wonderful. Really? It was delicious. So, <laughs> you know, and I think it was organic. I don't know for sure, but it was absolutely delicious. And I think it was just because it was right there, you know, one minute <laughs> from the farm to my to my pallet. <laughs> sure. Well, well, that uh, there's also a discussion that's going on related to uh, genetically modified mm -hmm. plants as well, and that the, the the case for that is plants can last longer. They can be disease resistant. You know, lots of benefits. On the other side of the debate, you know, people saying we're going to disturb the ecosphere. Mm -hmm by introducing different forms of plants that weren't n naturally arrived at. Does the university have any position on that? So the university has people on both sides of that discussion, um, but there is a lot of research going on that will really help in the long run, um, where, for example, they're trying to introduce vitamin A into rice. Um, trying to increase nutrient contents. And some of these things, you can traditionally do the regular breeding uh, over time to, to come up with those results. And in other cases, you may not be able to come up with the results fast enough. So as we look down the road, the prediction is that we're gonna have nine billion people on the planet in 2050. And so if you look at our food production and how much increase we've been doing with just traditional methods, we're not gonna have enough food for nine billion people. So there's really concern now of how can we increase production uh, for those staple products especially, but for all food products, so that everyone can have the opportunity to eat and live well. So when I look at what the scientists are working on in the GMO categories, they're all things that would help us health-wise or nutrient-wise down the road. Um, for example, right now in Florida, there's a horrible disease called citrus greening that is just wiping out the citrus industry. Really? And we really need our, our oranges and our citrus um, because you know that vitamin C content is really important for our well-being. We don't have that disease in California, but we're doing research on it right now. UC Davis and UC Riverside doing a lot of research on that to try to figure out how do you stop that particular disease. They, they failed in Florida. They failed in China. We don't want it here, and it's an insect vector disease. And what so does that mean? That means that a little bug called a psyllid actually carries the pathogen in its body and when it bites on the orange trees, it transmits Transfers. the disease that way. So it's a complicated disease cycle. You can tell already, it's very complicated. And so now the citrus industry is looking at how are we gonna stop the insect that transmits this disease? And how are we gonna build a better citrus tree that can withstand it if it does get transmitted? And so they're doing research on GMO trees, they're doing research on a lot of different angles and hoping that we get the answers before the disease arise because we've already got the insect. The insect has been detected in California. Really? But so far, that insect is not carrying the pathogen. Can you, can you shed any light on what's going on? We, I, I read about the bees and mm -hmm. that our bee populations are decreasing 
as well. Right. Um, is there any relationship that's been found between uh, our bee populations and some of the farming practices or pesticides that There's, are being used? Yeah, the jury is still out on why we're having the bee decline. Um, and that's something that we're very interested uh, here in California because our almond trees require those bees for pollination. So they've been looking very closely at, uh, there's, a, there's a mite that gets into the bee colony that causes some colony collapse. There are other diseases, they're just like us. They can get a bad cold or flu, and so the bees can get sick from other things. So they're trying to figure out, in a, sort of that CSI kind of approach, is what is it that makes the bee weak where it's susceptible to colony collapse? Um, and so there's a lot of different things in play. These colonies are in great big boxes. They get moved from state to state. So there are possibilities that they pick up something in another state and then we bring the colony back here and we don't know that they're sick. There's discussions that, well, maybe they need different kinds of pollen. So you'll see some uh, tree uh, orchards of, of uh, orchards where they've planted wildflowers around the orchard so mm. that the bee has a varied diet. So it'd be like us if we went and we only ate one food all day long. So this gives them a little bit more selection. A little bit of biodiversity. A little bit of biodiversity in their food supply. Um, but overall, this is a high area of research and UC Davis does have a bee center where we're doing quite a bit of research on those well, honeybees. In speaking about biodiversity, last Saturday I was at Steinhardt Aquarium in San Francisco and was uh, at their, um, whatever, their planetarium and they did a thing on biodiversity. Mm -hmm. When you study plants and you study plant pathogens, there are lots of discussions that take place within California about the preservation of, of different species, wetlands, um, plant types, things like that. And the, the, the practical approach sometimes is, look, this plant doesn't mean anything to us. Mm. And it's not a tomato, it's not a carrot, and it's not an orange. <laughs> So therefore, just let it go, let's plow it under, let's get rid of it, whatever else, it doesn't matter if it's gone. How does biodiversity and the presence of these various species or their absence affect this food supply chain as you all study it mm -hmm. at UC Davis? So one of the things that's special, I think, about our particular college is we are the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. So we can work in that space where the two meet. And that's where the biodiversity pieces come in. So we're looking at lots of different continuums where um, we're trying to look at how, how do we affect our biodiversity on this planet and not upset the food chains that are naturally in place as well as those that we have in place for the humans. And I think it's a, it's a very complicated area of study, but it certainly is clear that if we allow certain things to die, we find out way too late in, later on that that was really required for another animal that, that needed to eat that. And it's not necessarily linear. And it's not necessarily linear and it's not necessarily obvious. Sometimes it's really not really? obvious, yes. So that's where biodiversity is really important. In California, we do a good job of protecting a lot of our wildlands and I think that helps quite a bit. But there are other ways that we can support biodiversity. So for instance, we have rice farmers in this area that literally are flooding some of those fields over the winter time just so that the shorebirds have a place to land. Now isn't that interesting? So that, you know, to make sure that they still have their flyway and they can land in the winter time and you see all of the cranes and the beautiful um, uh, geese coming off the water and, and that's part of supporting the biodiversity because also within that water are gonna be all the little crustaceans and things that they like to eat. So we can do it together, but we have to be very cognizant. Today, w one of the debates that's going on right now is we're in the midst of a horrible drought. Yes. And you've mentioned rice farming and almond farming mm -hmm. at, at the same, w within this conversation. Both of those consume a lot of water. And 
we're being, uh, city dwellers are being asked to cut back and cut back and cut back. But it seems that the farmers are getting a free pass. <laughs> and so the conventional wisdom among us city dwellers is that the farmers aren't doing their fair share. The counter argument is, well, you need those farmers to farm because otherwise you're not going to eat. Not eat. <laughs> Give us a sense of the yeah. reality of the situation. So it is a very complex situation, um, but it's not as dire as it looks. So you drive by the rice field, you see a lot of water. That water gets recycled and reused in lots of different ways. So it's not like you flood the field, you grow the rice, and then you throw the water away. That water is going to be treated, recycled, and gone back into the system. So that's one thing to help people take a deep breath and realize that that water is not going to get wasted. The second thing is that, for example, the almond growers, they have reduced their irrigation requirements by 33 percent. See, I hadn't heard that. Exactly. This is the rest of the story. They've, re they've reduced their, um, their irrigation by 33 percent over the last 20 years. And a lot of that's come from research from UC Davis and other land-grant institutions where they're using a lot of drip irrigation, uh, just-in-time irrigation, and actually research was done to see how far can we take the tree to the brink of not having enough water and still get some production. What's the consequence of just sort of a meat cleaver approach and saying, okay, farmers from the Central Valley throughout California, we're chopping your water yeah by 25, 50 percent. What, what's, what's the impact? The impact is huge. The impact is a loss of jobs, billions of dollars, the loss of food, and the increase in price of food for everyone. Because essentially, California feeds the rest of the nation. This is a 45 to 48 billion dollar industry just in California, the highest of any state in the, in the union. So we really are the breadbasket for everyone else. So I lived in New York for 30 years. When I went to the grocery store to buy broccoli and lettuce, it was from California. So this is a, this is a big deal. Um, and we can't just chop them off from the water. They do need the water. And they're using it extremely wisely. Plus, when they have to buy it, they are paying exorbitant prices, anywhere from $700 to $2,000 per acre foot of water. That's a lot of money. So they're not wasting water, and they're doing everything they can. Plus, they're relying on the researchers at UC Davis, UC Riverside, UC Berkeley to come up with new varieties of plants that take less, that are more drought tolerant. Do you, do you also, um, at UC Davis, focus on also the extraction of the groundwater as well, the, the, uh, the underneath Absolutely. underground aquifers. Yeah. Because w one of the other big debates that's going on is that we are essentially emptying, you know, the, 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 the bottle of water that's right. underneath this state at a rapid clip. Yes. And so, and that actually was sort of a response to the farmers being turned off from the surface water. So that cleaver came down and they said, you can't have the surface water. So they said, okay, we'll, we'll have to use the groundwater. But that is being studied. And we're also looking at ways to recharge that groundwater. So we had a, when we have a big rain, we want to be able to find the, channel that water, capture it plug it back into the system. So that's another area of research that's going on right as we speak. What else are you working on out at uh, UC Davis that you're most excited about <laughs> at this moment? Well, it's hard to pick a few because our college is so large. Uh, we have over 6,000 undergraduates and 15 different departments between ag, environment, and human sciences. But we've got research on all aspects of agriculture, from soil science. We have a department called Land, Air, and Water Resources. That covers it all. <laughs> I'll make it easy for you. A a as, as a CSI investigator <laughs> on plant disease, OK? Just looking at sort of that limited mm -hmm. part of the universe, okay. which is very broad in itself, <laughs> what is it that, that you like to you know, sort of like poke into every once in a while and see what's going and on. And see what's going on. So I love to poke in and see what's going on with our viticulture enology group, the, the wine making group, and see. Is that what, a personal interest? That's a personal <laughs> interest. <laughs> and, uh, but I like to see, uh, because that's an interesting one where you can follow it from the production of the grapes and the diseases that attack those grapes to how they manage that 
to the, the value added product, which is the wine. And so that's a really interesting group. And they've been working on disease resistant grapes. Uh, and they've sequenced the genome for the grapes and they've done a superb job. They're just leading the nation in that area of research. I, I, I've, I gotta ask you this question in our final <laughs> moments. So, you know, I realize you've got huge administrative responsibilities running the school. Is there any benefit, like, do you, do you get a nice tour, like if you go up to Napa or Sonoma or someplace like that? I have had some wonderful tours. Um, and it, uh, today, tomorrow, I'm going to be with a group of students that are going up to uh, Fall River and we're going to be tagging fish and so I'm going to get to be out in the wilderness and in my jeans and really enjoying that. So yeah. yes, I do get a few little perks. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, Dean Dillard, thank you so much uh, for uh, joining us today and we wish you well in uh, your leadership of the, the college. Thank you, Scott. All right. And that's our show. Thanks to our guest and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.